Hi, my name is Ralph Zeman. Welcome to the Casper Project. The Casper Project is a beading project on a really grand scale. And in order to show off all the disparate elements, the beads, the uh, beaded AK-47s, the Casper, the military vehicle we beaded, we took over 22,000 square foot warehouse down in the Arts District. It's a series of rooms and as you go through them, it tells more and more of the story of the Casper. We have a video that runs about 20 minutes that tells the history of the vehicle and it also has first-hand victim accounts of what it was like to encounter these vehicles in the townships Soweto, Alexandria, Mamalodi, in the townships of South Africa in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So what I wanted to do with this exhibition was to bring all the pieces of the Casper project together. When we first got the vehicle, we didn't know exactly how we were going to beat it. We had this idea that that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to cover it in beads. And these panels really represent the technique we used. The one technique was really weaving it with a cotton thread bead by bead and making up these panels in shapes with patterns that were printed out on the computer. And then the other part of it was to use bead and wire to frame things, to cover things. Here you can see the bead and wire work, which is very intricate, very time consuming, as is the panels. Interestingly enough, when you get this many beads, it starts becoming very heavy. When you roll them up and it's six or eight or 10 foot long, it would take five or six or seven guys to put it on onto the Casper. What I wanted to do with these panels in particular was to juxtapose the beauty and the color of the beads with the sheer starkness and ugliness of military hardware. It goes back to the idea of exporting non-lethal, beautiful AK-47. The idea with the outfits was that if we were gonna recreate these photographs, press photographs from the 80s and 90s with this Casper that had been adorned in beads, how would we adorn the people, the, the soldiers, the police who were supposed to be on the vehicles. What we wanted to do was something very brightly colored and very asymmetric. We also wanted to sort of make it anonymous. So that's why in all the photographs they're either wearing a hood or a mask. So you really can't see who they are. There's a malevolence that's below the surface, but there's an anonymity to it as well. The photos were done in end of 2017. We shot them in Cliptown, which is an old suburb of Soweto. And a lot of them were reenactments or recreations of famous press photos from the 80s and 90s. The names on the photograph, the captions were lifted straight out of newspapers from the time. So here you have policemen sit on their truck after a tear gas canister went off. All the names were lifted out of press clippings from the time, out of photographs from the time. It was showing the Casper in its natural habitat. This is where it was designed. It was designed to go into places like this and it was designed as a weapon of oppression. And part of what we wanted to do with the project as well was to talk to residents. We took the Casper in and we did a series of interviews that made up part of the Casper project and that was talking to older residents, people who remembered the Casper from the 70s and 80s when they first started appearing on the streets of Soweto. The Casper, as you can see behind me, is a 13-ton police vehicle developed in South Africa during the apartheid years. We have adorned it with about 70 million glass beads, every single one of them hand-woven onto the vehicle. What we did with the colors and the shapes was I wanted to go for a 
modern contemporary look with the beads. A lot of beadwork is specific to a certain area or certain tribe because of the color and the combinations of the colors they use. We used a combination of more or less every color we could get our hands on and the idea was that it would be a sort of a camouflage but a very bright camouflage that we would try and mix as many colors as possible. This is a hull from a 1980 South African police Casper. We got the hull, we reconditioned it, rebuilt it. We had an engine that was remanufactured to factory standards. Spook One is the name we gave to the vehicle. Spook in Afrikaans and also in several African dialects refers to a ghost. It came about when this older Afrikaans guy came into the studio and saw what we were doing. He said when he was in the military, they used to drive around in them, they used to call them spooks. Spook referred to, there was a kind of a duality. One was sort of came from the name Casper, the friendly ghost. But within African culture, a spook or a ghost is a shade, an ancestor, it's something to be feared. So part of what the name meant or was supposed to do was, was instill fear in, in the population that it was being used to oppress. One of the guys on our core team, Boaz, is a preacher and an elder at his church and he very much wanted to take this message about bending your swords into plowshares. Yeah, he wanted to put the message on that we were taking this former instrument of war and making it into an ambassador for peace. It's one of the biggest beading projects I think that's ever been undertaken. We had about 100 people who worked on it, about 70 of them who were beading at, at any one time. It took about three years to do. The vehicle itself weighs about 13 tons. The beads weigh another ton and a half. About 70 million we know because we you know how many beads in a packet and how many packets in a box, how many boxes we bought. So allowing for some wastage and spillage, we think there's about 70 million beads on it. I come from a background of film and one of the wonderful things I learned making films was collaborating with people. The process is really big, what you're making is really big. You need talented people around you. We had a team, like I said, it expanded up to about 70 people beating at any one time. There was something wonderful about how everybody had their input, that everybody who touches a project leaves their fingerprints on it and uh, very grateful to the people I worked with. You know, they've become like friends, they've become like family. Different members of the crew would come up with ways of doing something. Sister Emma figured out how to do the wheel wells with a weave that would curve around and nobody else could do it, but she said she knew how to do it and she wove it. The Zimbabwean team were amazing with the bead and wire work. When we did the exhaust pipe of the Casper, we had to put it on only with wire because it heats up so much that any glue or anything like that would burn. So what I do with a lot of the beaded guns is to design them on the computer, but then somebody's got to make the shapes out of beads, out of wire, and make it all conform. Uh, and it's kind of fascinating because every different color bead has a different size, a different tolerance. It probably takes a single guy about three weeks to make an AK-47 with this much detail. We started manufacturing the AK-47s in 2013. It was reaction on my part to always seeing 
AK-47s in Africa, be that uh, Somali pirates or Ugandan warlords or Congolese rebels. And I wondered about this arms trade and where it was all coming from. And um, what the idea behind it was, was to reverse the arms trade. We would make these non-lethal, very beautiful weapons in Africa and we'd export them to the rest of the world. And the idea was that in doing so, for every weapon we sold, it would represent a month of expenses for one family in Johannesburg where I was working at the time. Buying and restoring and then beating the Casper was in some ways the easier part of what we were doing. Along the line we came onto the radar of the South African Defense Department who were very worried that this Casper would wind up in the hands of ISIS. And I said to them, listen, ISIS paints everything black. You've got to come see the colors. We were really lucky. The lady who came from the Department of Defense to do the inspection was an Indabele lady. And the Indabele tribe in South Africa is really well known for their beautiful, fine beadwork. In fact, a lot of our ladies were Indabele. And she was just so moved by it and touched by it. And um, we got their blessing. And then the, the next thing was, how do we import this into America? To do so, I had to get licensed by the Department of Justice and the Department of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives. So behind me is my license, I suppose, as an arms dealer. It's something I never thought I'd say. That's given us the permission to bring it into the U.S. and to sell it here.